COP26 is a United Nations meeting where countries come together to discuss how to curb greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to the climate change that's already been happening. Which sounds like a very bureaucratic event, but there's a lot at stake. It is the last best chance the world has to come together in order to do the things we need to do to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. Nearly 200 countries will meet at the annual Conference of the Parties, or COP, to address climate change. The first COP was held in Berlin in 1995. COP 3 in Japan led to the Kyoto Protocol. And COP 21 led to the landmark Paris Agreement. And what came out of the Paris Agreement was a really kind of an unprecedented and global pact that we would limit the warming of the planet to, quote, well below two degrees Celsius since the Industrial Revolution. COP26 will bring countries together to accelerate actions towards the goals of the Paris Agreement. So far, many of the goals made in 2015 have not been met, starting with emissions targets. The world has already warmed more than one degree Celsius since the late 1800s. And so I think that's the tension you'll see this fall is that the world is not, by any measure, on, on pace to hit those targets right now. And this is why we need more ambition, more ambition on mitigation, ambition on adaptation, and ambition on finance. Under the Paris Agreement, rich countries pledged $100 billion a year by 2020 to help developing nations reduce emissions and adapt to climate change. But those targets have not been met either. There are a lot of aspects to trying to move the world on such a big problem. And we talk about cutting greenhouse gas emissions and and hitting targets, but really there's a lot of other elements to it. I mean, there's how transparent is every country going to have to be and how do we enforce this? How do we help people, uh, countries that may not have the, the money to, to do what needs to take place to adapt or, or mitigate climate change? How do rich countries fund uh, some of these projects in poor countries and, and who's on the hook for how much and who's responsible for cutting um, you know, their emissions more than others because they caused the problem in the first place? You know, so it, it's hard uh, to get everybody on the same page and I think maybe harder than ever now that the pressure just ramps up for us to do more and, and to do it faster. Net zero by 2050, blah, 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 net zero, blah, 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 climate neutral, blah, blah, blah. Of course, we need constructive dialogue, but they've now had 30 years of blah, 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 and where has that led us? So I'm gonna be watching a lot of the major economies because what happens with the biggest emitters in the world is really gonna make or break whether the Paris Agreement is a success. The most obvious example of this is China. China is now responsible for about 30% of global emissions. That's a double the next biggest country, which is the United States, which historically has been much more responsible for climate change. That said, I'm gonna be watching a lot of the smallest countries in the world and the ones that are most vulnerable because this is uh, really the front lines of climate change. What comes out of the UN conference in Glasgow will dictate how we feel about the years ahead and what kind of pressure countries face to keep doing better uh, and to actually follow through on the promises they make, because there is a lot at stake. And I think we've seen that you know, in very visceral ways this summer, both in the US where there's wildfires and also around the world. This makes this moment that we're in where the world has to decide how to tackle this problem that much more urgent 